Science is the process of figuring out how the world works. And if you're a scientist, no matter what you study, the only way to do that is to look at the world. And obviously by the world, we mean not only this, but also this with this in it. And by look, we mean not just with our eyes, but also with scientific equipment. So whether scientists are studying the black hole at the center of our galaxy or viruses in the ocean, they're all trying to understand how the world works by looking at it. One of the first expeditions meant to really look at the ocean started with John Murray and Charles Wyville Thompson in the HMS Challenger in 1872. These scientists sailed around the ocean using weights and rope, measuring ocean depths, scooping up mud and animals from the sea floor. They took a lot of notes and they drew a lot of pictures. When Mary Anning went looking for fossils in 1823, she climbed the cliffs of Lyme with a hammer, a bag, and a notebook, and she also drew pictures like of the first complete plesiosaur ever discovered. Marie Curie, Darwin, Kepler, all of these people were looking at the world around them and using equipment available at the time, collecting and recording information about that world. They were collecting data. These days, scientists have a lot more tools they can use to collect information. They have this stuff. And still, the point is the same. Look at the world and collect data, measurements, Specimens, samples, photographs, readings, it's all called data. Whether you're working in the field or the lab, collecting data is a huge part of your job because it gives you a picture of the world. That is why data itself is a vital tool when building accurate theories that explain and predict how the world works. Like any tool, data has to be used correctly. If you use it in the wrong way, you get the wrong picture, which leads to incorrect or inaccurate conclusions. So, to use data correctly, scientists look at two things. One, how the data is collected, and two, how the data is analyzed. Studying the ocean and collecting ocean data has always been problematic. That's because there's a lot of ocean, and it's always moving. In 1872, the scientists on the Challenger sailed around for four years. They collected data at specific points and they brought those snapshots of data home. In the 1870s, almost nothing was known about the ocean, so any data was useful. Even these discrete snapshots taken at specific moments in time. The problem is the ocean is always moving, so to really understand how it works, especially how it changes over time, you need better data. The Ocean Observatories Initiative, or OOI, started in 2013 and is revolutionary. It collects an amazing amount of data. In the Pacific and Atlantic basins, scientists have set up data collection stations that use a variety of instruments that are constantly looking at the ocean. For example, autonomous underwater robots, solar-powered buoy sensor systems, cabled seafloor sensor systems, and cameras that are connected to the mainland with power and data. So now there's a constant stream of information coming from key parts of the ocean measuring things like temperature, the speed of ocean currents, how salty it is, salinity, how cloudy it is, turbidity, and how algae-y it is, fluorescence. What makes the OOI so revolutionary is that the data is collected continuously, meaning now you can track changes over time. More data gets collected in a day than the HMS Challenger collected in four years. This sounds like a lot of data, it is. That's why scientists need huge computers to keep track of this continuous flow of information. So now there's a bunch of data being collected and organized 24 seven by machines that never get seasick or tired. Okay, so now you've collected all this great data, but what do you do with it? Well, anyone with an internet connection can access the OOI data, which is awesome if you know how to use it. That's where analysis comes in. As a scientist, you analyze the data in three steps. First, orientation. You've gotta know what the data is you're looking at and where it's coming from. Are you looking at earthquakes on the sea floor or temperature? Are you looking at plankton in the water at a specific place over a period of three years or are you looking at a period of three months? Second, interpretation. You need to interpret the data. Now that you know where it's coming from, what is it telling you? What's happening to the plankton, to the temperatures? Is it going up, is it going down? How is it changing and when? And lastly, synthesis. 
Now that you know what you're looking at and you can see what's happening, now you need to synthesize an idea or hypothesis about why it's happening. And now this data has become a tool to start understanding the world. But it's an ongoing process. Your idea might require collecting more data and going through the analysis again. You know, what data am I looking at? What's happening in the data? Why do I think it's happening? And on and on and on. Your ideas or hypotheses should lead to a testable question that you examine by doing experiments or making models. Ultimately, data is a critical tool that allows scientists not only to come up with hypotheses, but also test them so that they can refine and adjust their theories, giving them a more accurate picture of how things work. And that's why without good data, you can't do good science. If you like the tools of science, please subscribe. And if you want to learn about more tools, click next video.